In this video, we're going to talk about meiosis. This is the process of making sperm and eggs. We are going to do a similar process to mitosis, where we go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. However, there's a few tiny differences. We're gonna go through that process twice, and we're going to separate chromosomes in a slightly different way. When we look at sperm and eggs, the number of chromosomes in those cells is half of the amount that is in a normal cell. So a normal cell is a somatic cell. It has 46 chromosomes and we call that diploid. When we produce sperm and eggs, they are gonna have half of the chromosomes. We're gonna have haploid cells so that when they combine together, we produce a diploid zygote. So a zygote is the first cell that is formed when sperm and eggs combine to produce a new human. We were all zygotes for about 30 minutes in our mom's fallopian tube. The process of producing sperm and eggs is called gametogenesis. In males more specifically, it's spermatogenesis, and in females it's oogenesis, because we're producing eggs. Where do these things occur? They occur in the gonads. Male gonads are testes, female gonads are ovaries. There's a few differences between gametogenesis in males and females. In males, meiosis begins at puberty. In females, meiosis is going to begin when they're still a fetus. They start to produce their ovaries during fetal development, and that's when meiosis is actually going to begin. Male gametogenesis occurs in the testes, and female gametogenesis occurs in the ovaries. Males can produce millions of sperm every day, whereas females are only going to have completed meiosis if pregnancy occurs. Meiosis is going to begin during fetal development. It will go through some of the stages. Then ovulation will occur, and only if that egg is fertilized will that last meiosis cell division occur. And lastly, males can have meiosis for their whole entire life, but it will decrease. Males produce less testosterone and less fertile sperm as they get older, but they can technically produce sperm for their whole life. In females, ovulation will occur once per month from puberty until menopause. Menopause occurs usually sometime in the early to mid 50s, and then no more eggs are ovulated. So pregnancy is no longer possible once women have reached menopause. We're gonna look at the stages of meiosis. Two sets of cell division is going to occur. At the end of this, you should be able to compare the similarities and differences between mitosis and meiosis. So remember that the purpose of meiosis is to make sperm and eggs. The DNA is still gonna replicate. The cell cycle looks very similar. When we had mitosis cell division, we had our G1, which is our normal growth phase. S phase is when the DNA replicated. G2 is preparation for mitosis. That all still occurs in the germ cells that are going to go through the meiosis process. When we look at the first meiosis cell division, the interphase occurred. During S phase, DNA replicated. Now the cell has double of the amount of chromosomes. The cell that we started with is a germ cell in the testes or the ovaries, and it was a diploid cell with 46 chromosomes. So when we replicated that DNA, then we had 92 chromosomes. And we can see that those chromosomes are condensed in the first prophase. Just like prophase of mitosis, you can see the chromosomes. You can see that there are sister chromatids that are still stuck together at the centromere. 
and you can see that we have homologous chromosomes. So we got one chromosome from our mom and one chromosome from our dad. Over here, the same thing, one from mom and one from dad, and they are replicated. We have centrioles that replicated during G2, and those centrioles moved to opposite ends of the cell and produced spindle fibers. These spindle fibers connect to the chromosomes at the centromere so that they can help to set the, separate the chromosomes. There is a weird and interesting thing that happens during the first prophase of meiosis, and that is called crossing over. And I'm gonna look at that in a little bit more detail shortly. For now, the prophase one looks very similar to mitosis, except that when we move into our metaphase, the chromosomes are lined up differently. In the first metaphase, the homologous pairs line up. The sister chromatids stay stuck together. This crossing over event has happened, which again, I will focus on that shortly. During metaphase, in mitosis, the chromosomes would all line up along the center of the cell and the sister chromatids would separate. But here, we are separating the homologous chromosomes. Anaphase, the homologous chromosomes are separating. The sister chromatids are still stuck together. And then we have a telophase, where we form a cleavage furrow and cytokinesis occurs, similar to mitosis. The only difference now is that we have haploid cells. In mitosis, the two new daughter cells have 46 chromosomes and 46 chromosomes. These cells are different. Now, the homologous chromosomes have separated. This one came from one parent and that one came from the other, and they are now separated, but the sister chromatids are still stuck together. During the second cell division, now we're going to separate the sister chromatids. When we start the second cell division, we do not have another S phase and we do not replicate the DNA. The DNA is only replicated in S phase at the very beginning. Then we have two consecutive cell divisions. The first cell division, we separate the homologous chromosomes and the second cell division, then we separate the sister chromatids. Now we are starting this process again. We have another prophase called prophase two. The DNA is condensed. The centrioles are moving to opposite ends of the pole again, creating spindle fibers that will connect with the chromosomes. When the chromosomes line up in metaphase two, now they line up so that the sister chromatids can separate. Anaphase two, the sister chromatids are moving to opposite ends of the cell. Telophase and cytokinesis, now we have four new cells that have half of the amount of DNA as the original cell that we started with. So the germ cells that begin in the testes or the ovaries are diploid and we create haploid gametes. So if these were sperm, they would then differentiate and grow tails. In males, the gametes are sperm. In females, the gametes are eggs. Notice that in our original cell, we had two red chromosomes and we had two blue chromosomes. The cell in this image that we started with had a diploid number of four. Each of these have two chromosomes. Each of these gametes are now haploid cells. When we have production of sperm, we will have one germ cell that will produce four sperm cells. When an egg is produced, each time cell division occurs, one of the cells will take all of the cytoplasm and the organelles, and the other one becomes a polar body. 
and it dies and it, it doesn't become an egg. The cell that took all of the cytoplasm and the organelles, that goes through meiosis too, when fertilization occurs. And again, one polar body will be formed and then the egg will be one very large cell that contains the cytoplasm plus the organelles. So and that includes the mitochondria. Mitochondria have their own DNA. So when an egg cell is fertilized by a sperm, the sperm is donating 23 chromosomes and the egg contains everything else, including all of the organelles. I wanna focus a little bit more on the crossing over aspect. Genetic variation is really important in a population because we need to have organisms that have slight differences in their genes. In a previous video, we talked about how the homologous chromosomes can have genes that are for the same trait, for example, hair color, and you can get a brown hair gene from one parent and a blonde hair gene from another parent, but those two hair color genes are slightly different. They are called alleles. So when you have homologous chromosomes, the alleles can be slightly different. When we have crossing over, we're going to switch little pieces of those homologous chromosomes. Here we have sister chromatids that came from DNA replication. Then we have homologous chromosomes that came from each parent. One came from one parent and the other came from the other parent. Let's suppose this is a hair color gene for brown hair and this is a hair color gene for blonde hair. They are both for hair color, but they are slightly different. So they are alleles. Sometimes the alleles can be the same. And keep in mind that each chromosome is going to have hundreds of genes. When crossing over occurs, it is only between homologous chromosomes. There would obviously be no point in crossing over between sister chromatids. When these chromosomes line up, they start to pair up as homologous chromosomes during prophase one. And this switching point can be random. Different times chromosomes will cross over. It might be a shorter piece, it might be a longer piece. It could be both ends that cross over. The resulting chromosomes are called hybrid chromosomes. They are now a mixture of the homologous chromosomes. Now when we make four new gametes, this chromosome will be in one of them this chromosome will be in another, this one in another, and that one in another. So now each of those four gametes are completely different. We always produce new gametes. This is why we can have siblings that are always different. Every single time two parents make sperm and eggs, the way that those chromosomes line up is different and the way that those chromosomes have crossing over is different. So sometimes traits will go together. If you have two genes that are very close together on the same chromosome, let's say for example, red hair and freckles, those genes are very close together so they often will cross over together and then those traits will show up simultaneously. If they were on different chromosomes or if they were far apart on the same chromosome, they would more often mix up. The whole point of crossing over is to have genetic variation. Gametes will be different every single time we have spermatogenesis or oogenesis. Genetic variation is a really important aspect for all populations. We can increase genetic variation in three important ways. So number one, we have crossing over. Number two, we have independent assortment. And this means that when those homologous chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, they randomly line up. It's not that the maternal and paternal are always on the same side, they can switch up and different chromosomes will line up at the metaphase plate in a different way every single time we make new gametes. And then the last way we increase genetic variation is through fertilization. Sperm and eggs come from different people, and every time that they come together, they form a zygote with different combinations of alleles. And lastly, here is a summary chart. 
I am comparing the two processes here, mitosis versus meiosis. Mitosis happens in all of our somatic cells. We make new identical cells that are diploid and humans have 46 chromosomes. Meiosis occurs in germ cells, in the gonads, the testes or the ovaries, and their purpose is to produce gametes, which are the sperm or the eggs. Germ cells are diploid and they have 46 chromosomes. The gametes are the sperm or the eggs, and they do not have mitosis or meiosis. Once those cells are formed, that's what those cells are. The purpose of having sperm and eggs is for fertilization. Sperm and eggs are haploid. They are the only cells in our body that have 23 chromosomes. Mm -hmm.